and as a result of that, it's, it's a little intimidating. But uh, it's a really a simple machine. And so we'll, we'll get a chance to look at that. And once, uh, I think that once you understand what it's intended to do, and essentially how it accomplishes that, then looking at the parts is a lot less intimidating. And as it is, shall we say, with the first computer, I think it, it is meritorious to understand it. And we're good. And we're rolling. OK. So um, 1943, Nikola Tesla is dead. He dies cold and alone in his hotel room, forgotten by a world he largely created. Uh, electricity emancipates us from work, from the dark, and uh, radio communication has brought the world together. Unfortunately, it brought it together in a war. And uh, in 1943, uh, he, he, he's forgotten, he's memorialized briefly, not by the US as much as by the Croats. Um, but this is really one of the first computers. It was not built in its own time, but Kara Babbage um, puts together this notion of a computing device. Uh, it's a beautiful machine. We, we got to see it at the, uh, the London Museum. Unfortunately, it's covered with glass and it's not running, but it's, uh, it's really elegant and I have no idea how it works. Um, in 1926, and these guys will appear twice again in the story, uh, this is the only picture I submitted with the talk. This is a tube counter. It can count to, I'm not even sure, maybe eight, maybe four. Uh, but it is used for counting radioactive events. And essentially, it's hooked up to a Geiger counter. And it, uh, it becomes important because of the nuclear activities at the time, which reminds us that in 1943, the hot items were nuclear energy, and crypt, uh, cryptanalysis, and to some extent computing. These were sort of the three killer apps of the day. <clears throat> this guy, Wynne Williams, invents the electronic counter in 1926. So Zeus uh, is working in Germany at the time. Uh, it's a little before the war, and he comes up with this mechanical device, which should remind you of Carl Babbage's, uh, sorry, Babbage's, uh, computing device, it's fairly mechanical. You have to inject much, much louder than that. Yes. Charles Babbage's differential it. engine. Yes, <laughs> thank For you. For 200 points. <laughs> so, so Carl Zeus is working on this machine and uh, it, it's a little electromechanical. It's got some uh, mechanical components. I, I suspect it's rather slow. Um, and it's an interesting parallel because Germany has one of the world's leading computer scientists at the time. They don't create a structure in which computers and crypto cryptography come together. Uh, Zeus spends much of the war essentially living in his parents' basement. Now, as a... As a, a tradition continues. <laughs> a continuing tradition to this day. <laughs> so... Anybody resemble that remark? <laughs> Bueller? Bueller? Yeah, okay. So the, uh, the Enigma machine, right, is introduced um, by a corp uh, corporate company in Germany for bank transfers, et cetera, using teletype or what have you. Um, before the war, it's a little bit simpler than shown here. Uh, it doesn't have the, uh, the Steckerbrot, which is the business sort of in, in the front there. Um, and, and the Polish crypto team, now the Poles are rather suspicious of the Germans. The Germans have made no um, no secret of their disdain for the Poles uh, during this period, and uh, the Poles being suspicious, and rightly so, as we see in history, are uh, keeping a close eye on their cryptography, and they turn out to be very bright. They make a very critical decision here, and I think historians can't uh, underscore this enough, that it's the Polish team that, first of all, figure out the Enigma machine, figure out how to break it, uh, figure out the wheel orders and monitor the changes as it goes from a commercial device to a military device, the complexity increasing like 19 million times. It's, the complexity of the Steckerbrot is very broad. Now, it doesn't rotate, it doesn't move, um, and these all have consequences, but the poles get off, um, get us going. Now, it's important to computers to understand that what the poles did was different than what the Germans did. 
and that is that they built a machine to solve cryptography, and it's not clear that that had been done before. There are various little wheels that, are, that allow cryptographers to look at, at different alignments of different key scripts, and there are different paper methods, and there are hole punches, and different mechanical ways to manipulate ciphers before then, but it's not clear, and GMARC can affirm that, that there's no machine to, de to, to solve the, the, cryptography. The, 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 the poles broke the original enigma um, using nothing more than graph paper and intuition. And when World War II started and they all escaped to Britain, they came with their break of the enigma and went to the British. They were hidden from view for a number of reasons, including the fact that one of them went back to Poland after the war, and to help keep him safe, it was never mentioned what all he did in cryptanalysis in the war because there was fears that the Russians would then send him off to a gulag or you know, chain him to a desk literally to make him do cryptanalysis. Hmm. So the Polish, the Polish contributions to Enigma cryptanalysis did not come out until after they were all dead, and now the modern histories have it, and there's a very nice memorial to them at Bletchley Park. Right. But you probably have never heard about them because that was intentional. So and the distinction I wanted to, to emphasize is that they built a machine. It was a small machine. It would have fit in this corner of the table. It had maybe three of these wheels that you see here on top of it and a hand crank. Um, but it spun the rotors and it ran an electronic test and it was an upgrade from the graph paper. The graph paper is a very interesting thing and uh, I might have an insight into how it works but I'd like to hear if you know how it works. It's, it's a little baffling and it doesn't seem to be a lot of documentation on the graph there, paper. There um, I have some thoughts on that. So this is uh, Enigma machine. Um, there are some weaknesses of the Enigma machine. Does anybody know what the weaknesses are? <laughs> we got the right people on the table, but you, you have an idea. Right, right. That, that's really the, the, the uh, Achilles heel of the Enigma machine. It's a, it's a folded machine. In order to get more complexity in a smaller box, and if you look at the American machines at the same time, they're literally four times the size of, the, of these machines. Um, they, they run the, the signal. It's 26 different electrical signals that run through the machine and they get convoluted at each wheel and then they reflect and they come back through the same wheels and because they would conflict obviously if they ever ended up on the same track care is made to make sure that in the reflector they, they don't end up coming back on the same wire so A can never end up back on the A wire um, and as a consequence of that the one thing you know for dead sure uh, when you're doing a comparison is that if you've got an E in the crypt text, you don't have an E in the plain text and vice versa. The entire bomb and everything they did at, at Bletchley Park related to the Enigma is largely predicated on this, just this one fact alone. So a typical way to break the Enigma is to take the weather report in the morning and assume that the word weather is somewhere in the first half dozen or dozen characters and you slide it along until you find a place in which none of the characters of weather report, right, co coincide with the crypt text. And once you find a place where those 12 characters can fit without colliding, then you run a series of tests to see if you can figure out what settings on the machine may have produced that and you get closer and closer and, and this worked time and time again. They had some other clues, they had code books that might get them started for periods of time and other things. Yeah, think giant brute force attempt with a little bit of a crib. You got a little bit of a head start, but you're still having to brute force a solution. There's no one elegant solution that just drops out. Yeah, I doubt that it was fully brute force. There's 77 bits of, of entropy oh, yeah. in the machine. They never got close on a brute force. They had clues. Right. There's, there's also, they would, send the, they would send a three letter setting and they would duplicate it. So it would be like ZBS, ZBS. And that was also a crib, which means you know a shortcut that they would use because the first six letters were always three letters duplicated. Right. And it turned out that weather broadcast, as I recall, the guy's girlfriend's name was Ava, and it was always using EVA, EVA. It never seemed to change his initial setting, which gave another little bit of hook into that poor guy up in 
up north sending the freezing weather. <laughs> es ist kalt, sehr kalt. Heute ist also kalt. You know, it's always <laughs> cold up there. So there were, there were a variety of these things, right? These were called sillies, S-C-I-L, which I think, uh, if we follow it back, it literally is the abbreviation of the girlfriend. Um, but all these, these little um, peculiarities of the different senders, some were lazy, they would always pick letters from like the left-hand side of the machine, or they would always pick like three keys in a row, and so they, they didn't have to look through all the key space, they had these patterns they could check. Um, one guy was so lazy, and they figured that he was probably smoking a cigarette, uh, because he typed the letter D just endlessly. The entire crypt text, when, when uh, recovered at Bletchley Park, Turing was looking over the shoulder of some guy, and he just noticed, as I guess he was a little obsessive this way, just noticed there was not one D in the entire um, crypt text. And it, 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 he painted this picture in his mind of a guy who's smoking uh, and using one finger to just pound out characters, right? Um, so th that series was immediately recovered in full, and it was so clean they were able to recover the wheel order of a new wheel that had been introduced. There's about four or five times during the war when the, when the Germans make the machine slightly more complicated or issue some change that upsets them. For example, they stopped doing this business with the three, uh, the three messages at some point, and so they moved on to other things. But the point is, I guess, that they kept really close track of the sec ops, right, which were bad. Um, and, they, and they had this one cryptographic weakness, which was the, the same character twice. There are other cryptographic weaknesses in the Enigma machine which we um, exploited last year in our test. It's worth mentioning because it's important to understand when we get to the end of this talk how this period of time shapes the modern cryptographic devices. So I'll mention it. There are 26 channels which we could think of as 26 bits if you like. Um, the problem with these 26 channels is that they're not in any way interconnected, even though they appear to be. Um, at the Steckerbrot, for example, you can take the, uh, the crypt text coming in, if you're decrypting it, right? You can take the crypt text and you can analyze only the C character or only the AL, L character or any, pick any character, right? If you analyze the result of that one character, you will get an alphabet. And that alphabet will have the characteristics of an alphabet if, it's, if the settings are right. And that means you can analyze the machine based only on a single bit stream. So we're going to get to that again and again, and then you'll understand it at the end. Uh, that's, that's one way to break the Enigma machine. All right. So around uh, 19, this is dated up, up above, but it's a little later than uh, 1943, I think, right? Uh, more? 1941. Um, Zeus introduces this as the Zeus III. The Zeus II is essentially lost, I think. I think, in fact, it was bombed. I think his parents' apartment was bombed and the, and the Z2 in it. Um, so bad luck. Don't hang out at your parents' apartment during wars. And invent the computer if you want anybody to know about it. It just turns out to be a bad place to work. Uh, so now he's upgraded to relays, right? It's, it's a cool machine. This is actually a picture of him much later in life. And he has reconstructed the Z3. Um, and he's showing it off here for the first time. Essentially, it was built and bombed, and it really never got off the ground. Again, the Germans have not created a central cryptographic unit. They have not combined that with computing. They have not created anything like Bletchley Park. If you were a cryptographer in the German army, you were attached to a unit. You probably spent most of your time encrypting and decrypting normal messages, and maybe you worked with a pencil and a paper on some other stuff. You're basically a clerk. Yeah, in your spare time. So <clears throat> the position was never elevated. And this brings us to 1943, Nikola Tesla is still dead. The Colossus machine is here. Um, and we'll, we'll get a build back into this again, but I want to start thinking about what this machine does. It, um, it's built on, the, it, it, it deciphers the Lorentz cipher, fundamentally different than the Enigma cipher. The Enigma cipher has one wire for every letter in the alphabet, 26. The Lorentz machine has five wires and it's binary. Those five wires correspond to a binary sequence. Every letter is a combination of the wires and not a single wire. Uh, we've made a massive jump from um, a very primitive electronic device to a, a proper digital 
encoding, the BODOT system, from which we now get the baud rate, for example, um, is in place. And there are still places where the five-bit paper tapes that were used for this are still in use. They're the very same thing. And it really is a true binary machine because they're using a pseudo-random number generator to XOR a key stream onto the ciphertext, onto the plain text, and punch it out on a paper tape. Yeah, this is would... in many ways a completely modern stream cipher. It just happens to be using five bits for characters. If anybody were here for ShmooCon 4, remember those yellow badges that were five bits <laughs> wide? That was basically an emulation of the paper tape. So the, uh, this is a picture of the ENIAC machine. It doesn't have great pictures. Um, it, like the, like the tube uh, counter in 1926, it's used primarily to, uh, it involved in the nuclear uh, age. I think it's part of the Manhattan Project. Now this is fun. This is not related to the war because it appears just after the war, but this is a Decatron tube. Um, it's a single tube that emulates the counter because it has some 10 poles inside of it. And each time you pulse it, the, uh, the connection, the ionization moves from one pole to another uh, because of the mechanical configuration of the two devices. It's very creative. And they built this entire computer using just this one counter method, which is a lot of fun because you can see uh, on the, on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side here, you can see the registers, you can see the memory, you can see the memory moved into the registers, and then you can, the logic is actually conducted in relays. But it's a very fun computer to watch because it's just transparent, and they're using it now for education in the uh, TMOC, the um, Museum of Computing there in, uh, in, in England. It's fun. You've seen it, right, the, the witch? Yeah. Yeah, also on YouTube, I have some, some films of the Decatron running where I took really good close-ups. They were running essentially a Turing machine program that stepped tapes along, and, and, and you get some good close-ups of the actual Decatron bits working. So the, the Decatron really is the, uh, is the highlight of the tube era, in my opinion. I doubt there's any, any uh, difference of opinion on that is, is the most awesome tube. All right. Lorentz cipher, we talked about the five bits, right? There's an example of the tape. You can see that there's three on the top and two on the bottom, and then the center line is the clock. Uh, initially, that had a sprocket, a mechanical sprocket, and it probably has a sprocket when it's run. Um, in all likelihood, the tape comes out of the machine with a center with that little small holes already punched in it. Um, the picture of the machine is the machine that makes the ciphers. It's, I think it's also the same machine that, that decrypts uh, under usual. Uh, under, under usual work. So the, uh, the picture on the right, I think, was actually developed by the Polas. No, no, not, not, not by the Polas, sorry. This machine was characterized in, at Bletchley Park. Um, I think it was um, Newman Maxwell who did a lot of their work on, on no? Not sure. Yeah, yeah, the, the Newmanry was the name of the division uh, that was largely responsible. Uh, there was also another character, Tunney. Um, Tunny was the code name. Right. Uh, they called it Fish. The, the Germans called it Fish, and it got the code name Tunny in uh, at Bletchley Park. So they, uh, they, they had these dots. Now, it was very difficult to, to come up with this diagram here and to understand it. And basically, what they did is they took the dots and they laid them out sort of like in rows of 50. And then they laid them out in rows of 49, and then laid them out in rows of 48, and then they laid them out in rows of 47. And they realized that there were certain ways that you could lay them out. And they would, they would produce um, non-random summations, right? And there were certain ways you could lay them out, and they wouldn't. And then once they had the first, the, the high number, basically around 48 or 49, I forget what, um, it's probably on here, right? Like the high number is 41. So once they, they had, had laid them out in 41, they realized that the other wheels were probably relative primes. So there's only a certain number of relative primes that are less than 41. And they were able from that to work out what these primary wheels were. Uh, so there's primary wheels and secondary wheels. Secondary wheels don't always move. For the sake of, of cryptanalysis at Bletchley Park, the second wheels never move. In other words, the only bits of data that they were able to use at Bletchley Park are the bits of data in which the second wheel doesn't move. Now, it moves about three times out of five. So for every five characters, three of them are lost, and two of them have the characteristic in that the second wheel is 
shall we say, not invoked. It doesn't move. Um, that, that was a critical flaw in the, in the, in the machine because it allowed, allowed them to split, the, to split the cipher sort of this way, right? Which is to say, separate the first wheel from the second set of wheels. So they split the cipher in, in that coordinate. Now, in addition to that, again, these are bit streams. There are three on top, two on the bottom. They were able to analyze the bit streams independently. Again, similar to the Enigma, in which the bit streams are not co-combined. The bit streams are able to be analyzed independently. The, the basic understanding, the, the basic way of, of looking at these is, is with the delta, what they called the not not at the time, which we would call an XOR now, which is, is this bit like the other bit? And it was always, is the current bit like the previous bit? You could say the current byte like the previous byte, and sometimes they looked at the entire byte, and we're gonna call it a five bit byte. Um, but usually, they would take two wheels. Um, they would take two wheels at a time and just look at those two at that pair, and they would count every time they were the same. Every time they were the same, or XOR was one, uh, they, would, they would index a counter, and every time it was different, they would not index the counter. If the code was right, if the key was right that they were using to test, the result would be less than 50-50. It would, it would shift slightly. Uh, that's the, that is how you break the Lorentz cipher. So the two sets, uh, and this is the text that comes from the Tunney report. If you see anything interesting there, it, it helps us describe what's going on in the machine. Now this, GMAR, this is I think the most interesting thing that happened during the war. This is, this is the depth. There was a message sent, and it's my theory that the, the, the transmit tape broke in Germany, and they went back to the teletypists and they said, we just lost the tape on that last one, can you make a new tape? And the teletypist says, yeah, we'll make a new tape. So they typed up a new tape. And in doing so, they didn't change the message settings. And, but the teletypist, being lazy, abbreviated more aggressively the second time. They were irritated, it was, it was late in the evening, it was time to go home. And so they said, we gotta get through this as fast as possible. And it's like 536 characters shorter the second time they type it up. Now these are very long messages. Um, as a consequence of that, they have two messages now, and they came in with the same message settings. This is, uh, this is the holy grail, shall we say, of, of decryption, especially at that time. So what you do is, it's kind of like a zipper. You start at the top, and you make a guess as to what the key would be, but you've got two messages. And you guess that the key might be an A, let's say, or the representation of an A in that digital form. And so that key results in two characters, and you put one, the, the one character on the left, the one character on the right, and then you work it down to the next one. And you, you pick a random one, say B. But you have to try a lot of options. Like you have to try A, B, C, and D for the first character, and then you have to go to the second character and try A, B, C, and D for all of those. So it recurses very quickly, but you can sort it out. And you can make some guesses and educated guesses and eventually in a couple of days of doing this, you'll get like the first word. And you'll find a, key, a series of keys that make sense on both sides. And once you have that, then every letter is just a simple 26 options, right? It's 26 tries for the next letter. And you go on like that and you, and you work out the key that makes both sides make sense. And often it's the same word, like sometimes it'll be shifted like this, and you'll know exactly what the word will be because you had it on the left side earlier, and that will tell you what the new word will be, and it gets very quick for times, and then you'll lose it for a while, you'll scratch your head, and then you'll find it again, and that's how you work out depths. Is that close enough? That, that, that's, that's close enough. The, the, the important thing to realize here is that when you have one of these, if you know the plain text, you can get the key stream just by XORing it onto the ciphertext. And this is, by the way, how the web crack worked in one of the various web breaks. This is how you break stream ciphers all over the place. This is why nonce reuse in counter mode of blah, blah, blah is a horrible thing to do and so on and so forth. This idea that, that stream ciphers take a random stream and XOR it onto plain text and that you can get back through reuse is a cryptanalytic thing that is here today. So the basic techniques have not changed. And for those who aren't familiar with the XOR function, it's basically not equal to. So is zero different from zero? No, it's not. 
it's the same. So you get a zero. Is one different from zero? Yes, and so on. Well, why do we care about that? Well, like anything, what's the identity in addition? Zero. Zero. Anything plus zero is anything. If there's an identity in multiplication, it's one. Okay, so what's the identity in X or? What X or to anything is the anything? And it turns out the identity is zero. Because if zero X or is zero, are they different? No, they're the same, so I get a zero. One X or is zero, hey, they're different, I get a one. So you see it preserves. So what, who cares? Wait a minute. Anything X or with itself is going to be zero, correct? Because it can't be different, it's the same. So if I have a message XOR with a key stream, and then I XOR that key stream a second time to the same message, every time I have the same key stream element appear, which it will always line up, one XOR one will be zero, or zero XOR zero will be zero, and so the two key streams essentially cancel out, they collapse into a bunch of zeros. But wait, Zero is the identity for XOR, which means that the entire clear text message drops right back out. And so that's the danger that you have there with the XOR function, is that if you allow that keystream reuse, which is of course what's called decryption, you try to do that deliberately, but if you as a cryptanalyst can get that somehow, game over, you win. So the depth, I compare it here to the um the, the stone here. I'm going to Rosetta. forget the name of the Rosetta Stone. Right. That's what it's like to be up on stage at 10 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why they do this, right? <laughs> this should start at 10 o'clock at night. Thanks, thanks. So they had this depth. They had a key. It was long, about 4,000 characters long. What do they do with it? So they, they, they said, we can take this one key from this one message, and we can play it over any message that's sent on this machine, it doesn't matter what the message setting is, it doesn't matter what the, what the tabs are, um, they can use the same key and play it over a message, and what will happen is that when it's synchronized, when the key is synchronized with a message, the result will be something other than random noise. The, the count of the, of the digits, one and the digit zero, will, will move from 50% and they'll move into something like 53% or 57%, right? Uh, and when they're not synchronized, they'll be off. So essentially you're doing this number, right? Where you're taking the key and you're taking the message and you're, you're starting lined up and then you index it by one and then you index it by two and then you index it by three and you do that 4,000 times until you've played the message against the key at every possible starting position. And then you write down the, the count of the ones and the zeros for each of those, if they're higher than the midpoint, you have, you have a signal. And they, would, and they would get signals this way. This was the theory. I think they probably did it a couple times on their desk, manually realized that it would take forever. Uh, and so they built a machine. And they, they called it the Heath Robinson because uh, Heath Robinson was the artist in London who, like Rube Goldberg, invented crazy machines. Um, this is the machine that looks, has a bedstead. It has two. Uh, tapes. One tape is one character shorter than the other, so every time they go around, they fall out of sync by one step. There are some optical encoders that read the data. Uh, that goes into a counter, which is, um, even at this point, I think they've brought in the team from 1926. They did the tube counters and some relay counters, parts they got from the post office to just do basic counting. And they started to, to run this machine. It was horrible. It would run, it would explode, tape would end up in the air like confetti, uh, like a Macy's Day Parade. It was um, very impractical, but it did demonstrate that it was possible to do this. Um, and this is key. Um, Tony Flowers, Tommy Flowers, Tommy Flowers. Uh, don't forget that name, by the way. When you're using your computer, every once in a while look up, thank God, and Tommy Flowers, that you have a computer. Uh, one of them is responsible. Uh, <laughs> so he, he looked at this machine and he said, yeah, so the problem with this machine is that these tapes and the synchronicity, the sprockets, uh, it's destroying the tapes and everything. What we need to do is get rid of all the mechanical things and make it electronic. And we'll take all of that key space that we discovered with the length and we'll commit that into a series of tubes that will play out the same numbers as they go around. Um, 
and we'll produce that tape electronically with tubes. And then we'll take the other tape, we'll get rid of the sprocket, and instead of telling the tape where to be, we'll just read where it is by shining light through the hole where the sprocket went, and we'll read that light on the other side, and we'll index the machine as a clock at that point. And then there'll be no sprockets, and the, and the, and the tapes will stay on the machines, and we'll be good. And they did. And that leads us back to this machine. So this is the advanced version. They did. They did. So Robert doesn't have a microphone, so I'm going to stop him right there. But what he's saying is, it's true that, that Tommy goes back to the group. I think uh, Max Newman, Maxwell, and others, uh, Turing maybe there as well, and he he proposes this that we're going to build this massive machine. We're going to have all the tubes that it takes to make these 4,000 characters show up at the right time, and and they say, yeah, I don't think so. That, that sounds, sounds absurd. Uh, one of the problems at the time was that tubes were considered to be unreliable. Everybody had a tube radio, and everybody's tube radio was broken more often than it was fixed. Uh, this is largely because when you turn it on and you turn it off, it's like kicking it in the, in the, in the nuts. Um, <laughs> the, but Tommy Flower had a different experience, and that was that he operated at the post office research station, uh, and they had machines that used tubes, and they just turned them on once, and they never turned them off and uh, he, they lasted a long time. So his experience was very different. And he had the confidence that he could build, you know, like 5,000 tube machine, 10, 12,000 tube machine, and, and get it all running at, at once. By the way, why do you care about using a tube? Why not just a piece of wire? What does a tube do for you? Yeah, it, it basically a vacuum tube allows current to flow one way, but it won't go back the other way. And that's very important because now you can have a logic gate or the equivalent. You can make things move forward. Uh, they're very fast, right? So the alternatives were relays at the time. And, uh, and they just didn't have the... Uh, they didn't have the speed in order to do this kind of work. So what we see in the Enigma machine is that the Germans made the machine more complicated and they reacted by bringing in that tube and created a tube. Uh, one part of the Enigma machine was implemented in tubes later on, so it was much faster. Uh, the tubes were just where the speed was. This is a description of what the Colossus machine has completely. We've touched on most of it. Um, if you read it there, this is a description from the Tunney Report that was released, I think, in 1970. Here's a, a graphic. Um, so real quick, we've got a tape reader that goes to the tape reader, right? Then it goes to this, which is the bitstream combiner. A lot of XORing is done there. Is this like the other? And then it goes to counters. There's a lot of control that makes the printer work. Um, and this is the internal bitstream. We talked about that. That's the 4,000 characters that are, that are looped out of the machine. So it's pretty simple. And we can implement it today with, with very little trouble. Here's some of the parts. This is where the photocells read the tape. This is, of course, where uh, some settings are made. It has a variety of settings, mostly because they could analyze the first two wheels or the last three wheels and so forth. They could cut the cipher um, sideways. We talked about cutting it wheel to wheel. They could also cut the bit streams in half. Do you see where we're going here? If you can cut a cipher in half, you can <laughs> reduce its complexity exponentially, right? If you can cut it in quarters, you can reduce it massively more, right? They, they were able to cut it. Uh, in, in two dimensions, and, and that's what allowed them to do this. was made in US, the simple typewriter. Uh, so there was a second version of the Colossus machine which um, had more capacity. It used the shift register, and they could do five steps of the tape instead of one step of the tape each time. It was faster, but a lot of the complexity comes from that. It's not really important to understand. Des. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to jump in real quick. In the in the rebuild of Colossus, there are three original parts from the original Colossus. One of which is one of the photo cells there. There's also one of the transformers, and I forget what else. But one of the one of the the, the tubes valves is, is also an original. Um, an amazing thing about Colossus is that the clock cycle was the light shining through the holes in the paper tape. And so the faster you could run the tape across a bunch of pulleys, the faster it would run. 
and it was completely clocked by the paper tape going, and it, it, it ended up being extraordinarily fast when actual redos of Colossus were done on a modern computer, it took a two gigahertz Pentium to be as fast as Colossus. You know, and this was the 1940s. It's actually built more like an FPGA than a sequential computer, if we want to make a comparison. The logic you wanted to run was set into the machine before you turned it on, and every, everything run, uh, every, every logic gate was connected to the other one in real time, right? So, so let's talk DES, right? DES is different because of Colossus and because of Enigma. There are problems with Colossus, problems with Enigma, almost the same problems. You can subsect or subdivide the parameter space. The complexity of the machine can be divided. You can analyze parts of it in isolation. In addition, the Colossus machine, uh, the, the Lawrence cipher really in practical use did not make reference to the prior character. DES cr creates a situation, it solves both of these problems and really moves us into the modern era. Um, it comes out of a time in which there was a lot of analysis being done on the Colossus machine of key tapes and other things to make sure that they were, um, that they were random. They were well aware of the, the problems that had happened with Colossus, even though the general, general world was not at that time, 1970. I think DES is introduced even before then. Uh, so what are those? First of all, permutation, where the bit stream channels are mixed, mixed up. So you can't just isolate the second bit or the third bit or the fourth bit and analyze those by themselves. You have to analyze all of the bits of DES in order to get any kind of result. The second is it makes reference to prior characters. So it's like 56 bits wide, which is roughly 10 characters. None of those characters exist in isolation. In both the Enigma and the Colossus, the characters exist in isolation. So in closing, this is Alan Turing. It's, uh, I think he was, he was uh, the queen, I think, announced that uh, the crown would no longer hold a grudge against him for buggery. <laughs> which is a very modern thing for the queen to do, I thought. <laughs> Speaking of modern things. Um, yeah, he was, he was chased uh, for the rest of his life after this. Uh, he, he also died alone, forgotten. And uh, he had been separated from everything he'd ever done. He was run out of the, the military. He was run out of his profession. And uh, he, he um, was castrated chemically uh, after his uh, trial for buggery, and, uh, which means, by the way, Bulgarian, so it's a little bit of a racist twist, if you will. Um, there's, a, there's a closing scene in the Cat's Cradle when the lead character dies, and he, uh, he takes a bit of the, the Ice Nine and touches it to his lips, and he puts his finger up. And Alan Turing dies, I think, on his back. Um, and, and by the table is an apple that has been soaked in, uh, I believe it's cyanide? Uh, I think it's cyanide, yeah. About three ounces of which are found in his stomach. Thank you very much. So there were two comments there. One is that the, uh, a lot of women were used, they were called wrens, and they operated the machine on a very regular basis. It's, it's interesting, uh, some aspects of computing was actually uh, materialized in that time because they would give the women very specific instructions that looked like, like, if this happens, then do this, and then loop through this until you get there, and if this happens, then do. So they were literally writing instructions to the, to the wrens, of which there were thousands. 
um, in very, very descriptive ways. And, and then the, the women would execute these instructions. So there was a kind of precursor um, in that way. And yes, the women had a tremendous role at Bletchley Park. Yeah. Yeah, the math, the math at that time was fabulous. Most of it's well beyond my understanding, absolutely. We just got a brief window into it by, by doing some of the work ourselves, but yeah, brightest minds of the time, definitely. Thanks again, everyone.